The summer that I was seven, my mother was constantly glued to her computer screen. She was so busy working that the only way my little brother and I could get her attention was by taking a piece of paper, writing on it, and sticking it between her and the computer monitor. I said, Mom, what could possibly be so important that you're not paying attention to us? And she said that she was doing research. What's research? Research, she said, is when you get to discover something new that nobody has ever known before. I couldn't believe it. Nobody has known? We have so many books and so many libraries, and adults know everything. I decided then and there that this was worthwhile. I was not going to be resentful, and I too was going to join her and do research. After all, boldly seeking out new knowledge, that sounded like being the ultimate explorer. My mom had a secret life. She was working to finish her PhD in theoretical physics at a time when there were very few women in that field. She had paused her degree when we were young, and she was now determined to complete it. It was that determination and, dare I say, obsession with her quest that really inspired me in my own path to do research. So now I, too, do research. I'm a biologist, and I have my own obsession, understanding the cell. I remember the first time that I learned about the cell and got really fascinated by it. We were in middle school, and we had to draw the parts of the cell, consisting of the plasma membrane, the nucleus that has the DNA, and the rest of the cell, the cytoplasm. My best friend showed me a diagram of the cell where the cytoplasm was filled with so many other structures with really strange names like Golgi apparatus. <laughs> I, I thought she was wrong. After all, why would the teachers hide this from us? I told her she better not draw those blobs into her homework assignment. She was going to lose points for doing this wrong. And she did draw them in. And she did lose points, but not because she was wrong. Cells actually do contain lots of structures because she didn't follow the instructions. But her actions really inspired me and showed me that there was so much more to the cell. But this picture is just an illustration. Cells don't look like this. Here's an example of what cells might look like based on actual data collected by the team that I now work with. And you can see that there's actually a lot going on in there. And that's just, just scratching the surface of what's inside the cell and why it matters. I come from a family of physicists. My father, my mother, my uncle, my only cousin, they all got their degrees in theoretical physics, studying the absolute smallest pieces of the world, subatomic particles. Even my little brother went into physics, although he veered the other way, studying galaxies far, far away, using giant telescopes on Earth and in space. He works with Hubble Space Telescope now to create images like these that he contributed to, peering into the vast deepness of our universe. And we just know when we look at these images that we can understand the secrets of the, the creation of our universe from them. And physicists and astronomers have figured out ways to do that. So why would I want to do anything else? I was predestined to be a physicist from the day that I was born. But while my brother dreamt of the stars, I dreamt of understanding life and the fundamental unit of life, the cell. So while other kids might rebel by staying out late, dating someone their parents don't like, maybe setting something on fire. I decided to separate myself from my family by becoming a biologist. So now I, too, have the privilege of using state-of-the-art, cutting-edge technology to peer at the absolute smallest pieces of life, the cell, and the things inside it, using microscopes to create images like this, where we can see that just like the sheer beauty of the stars is the sheer beauty of images of ourselves. And just like those images of the stars, I believe images of our cells and videos taken over minutes and hours hold those same sorts of secrets, just waiting to be revealed. There are millions of molecules in each one of the trillions of cells in our bodies that somehow come together and create magic like the brain power of Albert Einstein or the strength and determination of cancer warriors. But it's those same cells that are the basis for disease. And we don't understand that yet. Why don't we understand? After all, doctors and biologists, we've been looking at cells for centuries. It's because the cell is just so complex. There's just so many parts in it. We don't understand how those parts come together in space and time. Just like, oh, we do know some things. 
um, special doctors, pathologists, have looked so much at disease tissues and healthy tissues from patients and healthy people, they've trained their brains to just by looking know whether a cell has disease, what disease it has, and even what treatments to recommend if it's a disease like cancer. And they're looking at cells in such a superficial way. Imagine what we could learn if we could look at them more deeply. Just like physicists have found patterns and rules in the chaos around us to give us an understanding of our world, I believe there are patterns and rules inside the cell. We just haven't seen those rules yet. I believe that if we can understand how a cell is organized, how its parts come together in space and time, then someday we can look at a cell and we will know what that cell did, what that cell is doing, what that cell will do, and how it does so. So, why do we care how a cell is organized anyway? Imagine the cell as a city. Imagine the nucleus and other structures as big landmarks in the city, power plants, factory schools. And imagine the other players in the city, like people, going about their business on their own path, but on paths that are easily affected by the paths of others. You put those landmarks and paths together, and you start to see patterns of behavior. As you can see here, for example, in this visualization showing you the patterns of behavior of people going from home to work in the morning rush hour. Each city is unique. Just each city is unique. Just imagine a Midwest city that would barely notice a snowfall. Compared to our city, Seattle, which ground to a halt with just one major snowstorm back in February. Just like our cities are unique, they have their particular landmarks, their particular strengths and resources and patterns of behavior, each of our cells is unique too. We have specialized cells in our brain and in our heart, and even within those, each cell has its own particular way of behaving. So just like each city responds to challenge differently, the particular organization of each cell changes how it responds to challenge, in this case, disease or mutation. So if we want to be able to try to understand the cell, it's like a city. We want to be able to have ways to know where the landmarks are, what they're doing in space and time, how the patterns of behavior get created. And then we can start to create simulations and models and understanding so that we can predict what a particular cell might do when it is faced with a challenge, like Seattle with a snowstorm. So there I was, a few years later, in college, majoring in biology, um, learning, to, uh, learning to do experiments, working in a lab. My 18-year-old self could spend hours in a dark room staring down a confocal microscope, watching cells and the parts of the cells do their thing in space and time, analyze them. I still do that now. I was a kid in a candy store. I was taking my absolute dream class, upper division cell biology. I was literally studying the unit on cancer and how cancer is an example a terrible and fundamental example of cell biology gone wrong. When I learned this myself, when my mother was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a deadly blood cancer. Never before had I read the textbook so quickly, learned and taught myself to read the primary literature, clinical trial papers. Never before had mathematical plots and statistics mattered so much as the amount of blood in her, the amount of a protein in her blood that showed us whether her cancer was going down or coming back. But it was those studies and that data that allowed my mother to make decisions about her treatment. Decisions she tried to make so that we would have more time together. And we did get more time together. Almost three whole years before she died. I found myself, and I still find myself, so deeply frustrated with that incomplete knowledge I marveled at when I was seven. But every little bit of knowledge helps. Every little bit of knowledge about disease that helps bring us to the next step. We were ever so slightly too late for my mom, but we are in time for many others. Just a few years after she died, the prognosis of her cancer improved incredibly. And nowadays, if you're lucky, it can be more of a chronic disease than a deadly cancer. So I have continued to immerse myself in really wanting to understand how a cell works. I am deeply fascinated by the mysteries of the cell, and I deeply appreciate that understanding the mysteries of the cell and overcoming that grand challenge is gonna be a basis for understanding disease. And I'm not alone. I work in a large, incredible, interdisciplinary team of people who all work on the same project and all share that same goal. 
Our favorite tool, my favorite tool, is the light microscope that makes parts of the cells glow, the light microscope and methods that make parts of the cells glow and that we use to put the cells back together so that we can watch the cells do their thing in space and time and we can co collect images and turn that into data. And this data, we believe, holds the secrets to how the chaos and messiness of the cell has rules and patterns and then becomes the key that unlocks disease. It's funny. Now, when I stare at a computer, distracted from my kids who are vying for my attention, I realize that I've come full circle from that time that my mom told me what it meant to do research, and I hope I can inspire her grandchildren. <laughs>